Thank you for joining us today for the session, New Voices um, for Spina Bifida, How Parents Can Teach Their Children to Take Control of Their Bowel Program. New Voices for Spina Bifida is a series of presentations led by industry experts that address the medical and social needs of individuals living with spina bifida and their families. Today's topic is being presented by Belinda Coyle, BSN RN Senior Clinical Specialist for Continence Care with Coloplast. Prior to her time at Coloplast, Belinda was a certified rehabilitation registered nurse in the acute hospital setting, specializing in the care of adults and the children with spinal cord impairment and disorders. She was also a faculty member of the Neuro Recovery Training Institute for many years with a focus on neurogenic bladder and bowel. We're thrilled she's here with us today. Before we get started, I just wanna mention a few things. Although you are muted throughout the session, we welcome your questions using the Q&A feature with Zoom. This session is being recorded. Everyone who registered for this event will receive a link after the recording. Closed captioning is enabled. And last but not least, thank you to Coloplast who is graciously sponsoring today's session. And without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Belinda. Thank you, Stephanie. And good evening to everyone. I'll say evening because it's seven o'clock my time. <laughs> I'll take a quick minute to go over uh, just the agenda. Um, so tonight I'm going to provide an overview of neurogenic bowel dysfunction related to spina bifida. Uh, I'll identify some bowel management methods, methods for neurogenic bowel dysfunction, as well as discuss some considerations for independence with bowel care. And we'll have plenty of time for um, question and answer session at the end. So if you want to put um, questions in the chat, that would be great. Um, and we can get to those at the end. So I want to start by talking about bowel management and spina bifida. So we know that managing the bowels is really one of the biggest challenges with the spina bifida population. Um, only 32% are reporting normal bowel function. So <clears throat> as far as the complications that can come, come along with neurogenic bowel dysfunction, it's primarily going to be constipation versus incontinence. So depending on where the lesion is located, um, the person could present with uh, upper motor neuron bowel behavior uh, or AKA spastic bowel uh, is what we sometimes call that. Um, and those um, patients will tend to be more constipated or impacted. Um, and then you also have the lower motor neuron or the, for the lower lesion, um, lower motor neuron or also known as flaccid bowel behavior. Uh, and that's where you might have more difficulty with leakage or incontinence. Um, there's really an inability of reflex response to keep those sphincter muscles uh, tight when it's not time to go to the bathroom. Um, and you tend to have a little bit lesser tone uh, in the rectum overall. So um, that's important to keep in mind. Um, also, very important is that everybody's different. So keep in mind that it's really um, a good idea to become established with a healthcare provider that's knowledgeable in spina bifida and uh, neurogenic bowel dysfunction to really help individualize um, a plan to make you the most successful. Um, also, if the bowels are not well managed, um, it can put the person at further risk for other complications, um, like issues with the bladder, uh, skin breakdown, which would include those anal tears or, or anal fissures, hemorrhoids, uh, shunt malformation, um, and just really an overall uh, poor quality of life, which we really want to um, try to stay away from. So um, there are lots of different types of bowel management methods. Um, and as you see on the pyramid here, uh, transanal irrigation, which is also TAI, that's what the abbreviation stands for, um, that's in the middle of this pyramid. So we call that in the medical world, <laughs> as uh, we can refer to that as a second line treatment or second line defense, if you will. 
Um, so if somebody has failed or say it's not working for them, their bowel care um, management program is not working for them, uh, transanal irrigation could be something that's considered. And so if you look at the bottom of the pyramid, you'll notice that you have your, what we call first line treatment options. Those are going to be, some of those things are, are something that you can modify or really, um, you know, try to help regulate on your own. You know, you can be responsible for what kind of food that you eat uh, or that your child eats. Um, and also the hydration status, making sure that they're, you know, getting enough uh, water and fluid intake. Um, the medications uh, can be taken orally. Um, so there could be medications to help with the stool consistency, which may um, be a bulking agent. It could be a laxative. Uh, those things you can kind of help figure out in collaboration with the healthcare provider. Uh, there's also rectal medications, uh, by the way, of suppositories um, or mini enemas. There's cone enemas. Um, there's also manual evacuation. So for those with that more flaccid type bowel scenario or the lower lesion, um, sometimes that's helpful to um, manually evacuate the bowel. Um, and then there's also digital stimulation for those with that more spastic um, bowel or you have a, a little, you know, you have a tighter tone in your rectum. Uh, and that digital stimulation will help elicit a reflex response that makes those sphincter muscles um, open up so that you're able to, to use the bathroom. So all of those um, are considered first line treatments. Um, if you're still not satisfied, if you're spending tons of time in the bathroom, um, there's accidents in between, uh, you know, times for the, the bowel program to occur. Uh, those, those would all be considered, you know, a failure. Um, and that is where transanal irrigation may um, be something that could be considered or helpful. And we do know that um, with transanal irrigation, it is very effective in managing that neurogenic bowel dysfunction um, in, a, in a more controlled manner. And our studies, you know, a lot of the studies have shown that um, it can take an average of a day or two for new um, feces to re reach the rectum. So some people will be on a daily regimen. Um, sometimes you're able to go to an every other day regimen, um, but it really does help to keep um, that person continent uh, in between the, the bowel care um, program. Uh, at the top of the pyramid, you see those more third line um, treatment options, which are a lot more invasive. So these are all gonna be surgical procedures uh, I won't get into detail. If you have questions um, at the end, feel free to, to ask, but those are definitely the more invasive things that we want to really try to stay away from if, if, if you can. Um, so let's talk about transitioning to independence. That's what the, you know, the beef of the, of the call is about tonight. So um, first thing I want to kind of remind you of if you've not been told hopefully you have but you always want to empty the bladder before you start any um, bowel care regimen uh, everything you know down in, in that area kind of works together I call it human plumbing um, so you know if one thing isn't working you know chances are the other thing's not going to be able to work very well either so if you have a bladder that's empty it's going to be easier to um, get that the bowels empty as well so um, some other things to take into consideration are uh, when you're really assessing like the readiness of the child um, for independence, um, you're going to be looking at physical aspects, cognitive functioning, and also psychological readiness. So uh, as far as the physical abilities, um, I put on here safety first because you really, really want to uh, keep that in mind. Um, are they able to safely transfer over to a toilet on their own or are they going to need assistance? Um, you want to look at um, positioning is super important. So positioning is the recommended position, I should say, for really any bowel care regimen is going to be in an upright seated position. So on a toilet, if possible, that's how 
it's the quote unquote normal way to defecate or to, to use the bathroom. Um, so if we can get them into that position, that's going to be great. Um, you may have to have some help with that um, by the way of durable medical equipment or DME. Um, if you have no clue um, what you might need, that would maybe um, be a good time for you to get with your healthcare provider. Talk about um, maybe getting a consult with an occupational therapist or a physical therapist to help with some of those um, toileting um, challenges. Uh, they might be able to help you uh, figure out, you know, what's the best option as far as a bedside, you know, do you need a bedside toilet? Do you need a, a toilet that fits over top of the, of your regular commode that has arms on it? Uh, do you need a shower chair slash potty combo? What about a squatty potty? Um, you might want to add some grab bars um, to make it safer for the transfer and um, ability to move. So it's really going to depend on the um, the physical capability of the child, and also um, take into consideration trunk control. So do they have you know enough abdominal functioning and back muscles to you know hold them up, or you know are they going to need a, a weight, something to lean on? So for instance, um, I know I had recommended. Back in the day when I was still working bedside at the hospital, hospital, we would have some of our kids sit backwards on the toilet because they were able to lean over onto the, you know, the back of the toilet and it would make them more stable and it was safer for them and they could lean forward and, you know, push on their bellies and it helped them to um, be able to defecate easier. So those are all um, things to really take into consideration. Um, as far as the physical aspect. Um, also wanted to touch on timing. Um, timing is, is really, really important um, and consistency of the timing is important. So if you think about how our bodies work, um, your peristalsis or the movement of the food and waste through the body, through the, through the GI tract, I should say, um, starts when you put food in your mouth and you start to chew, that's kind of what triggers that response. And so, uh, you know, any bowel care regimen is going to be best if you can do it after a meal. So 20 to 30 minutes after a meal is, is usually ideal. Um, and you want it to occur at the same time every day or, or if you're whatever type of regimen that your healthcare provider has told you. So if you're doing a daily or an every other day, or sometimes every three days, you still want it at the same time every day. Um, so a lot of my former patients that I took care of um, chose to do their program at night. It was easier for them. Uh, they were able to, you know, go to school and do after school activities and eat their dinner they would, um, you know, wait for 20 minutes or so after dinner and they would do their, their potty routine and um, take a shower sometimes at, at that time as well and then be, you know, winding down for bed. Um, so it's really a good, um, a good idea to pick a time um, and try not to change it. And if you do have to change it, you know, don't do that very often. <laughs> Um, I'll get off my soapbox on that. Thank you. I think I, I hit home with um, making sure that you're doing it and being consistent. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, again, is that cognitive functioning. And we know that, you know, kiddos with spina bifida can have some, you know, learning and cognitive challenges. So use your resources when it comes to this. Um, do they need a reminder um, to help them remember to do bowel care? Use the technology. Uh, most kids will these days have a, a watch. I have my watch on right now. I set reminders on my phone all the time for myself. Um, so use the watch, use the phone, use an iPad, anything that can help uh, set an alarm clock, uh, whatever you need to do. Verbal cues work too. So if you need to just gently remind them, hey, you know, it's time to do your bowel care um, until they can get in a good routine. Um, cues. For reminders, like I said, verbal cues are great. They may need that reiteration of steps of the process, like how are they supposed to do it? If you think about that, um, 
you know, even myself, if I'm watching somebody do something and it's like, oh, well, you know, that seems like it's going to be pretty easy. I, I could probably do that. But the first time that I'm doing it, you know, I might, I might not remember because I wasn't, you know, it's like you see one and you do one and it makes it easier. Um, so reminders might be helpful and that's okay. Um, especially if they're using a device, if they're using something like transanal irrigation, because th those are extra steps that they have to recall. Um, there's, there's lots of, um, you know, resources as far as, as that goes to, you know, there's, you know, things that you can put on the back of the bathroom door that gives the step-by-step -step process, but you still maybe need to reiterate those steps. Um, I will say compliance is huge. Again, I said consistency with timing, but you have to do it. So you have to be compliant with the regimen. Um, if, if you're being told by the healthcare provider to do it every day, you know, do it every day. Um, because if you're not if you're not compliant with the regimen, it's, it's, chances are it's not going to work. Um, psychological factors are, are really, really big. And that's something that, you know, I think a lot of times we don't put a whole lot of emphasis on, but maybe need to do that a little more. Um, ask your child if they're ready to learn. Are you ready to try to do the bowel program? And don't, just assume that, you know, just because they're at a certain age that they should be doing it or they should want to do it. Um, everybody's different. We, we're all different. So just have that communication. The open line of communication should be, you know, two way street. Find out what motivates them to be more independent. Um, you know, sometimes what you think might should be the motivating factor is isn't really. So talk to them about those things. Um, is it a sleepover at a friend's house or is it a, is it a social gathering that they want to go to or they want to play sports and they want to make sure that they're not having bowel accidents. They want to wear, you know, regular underwear or panties. Uh, they don't want to have to wear a diaper or pull up anymore. So figure out what motivates them and really encourage uh, them to be more independent um, in, in that way, you know, with that in mind, um, you want to practice positive reinforcement uh, to really help promote their independence and also that compliance, which is really going to lead to overall um, success with the bowel care. So just, um, just put a chart on here with age related guidelines for transanal irrigation. Um, you've got your ages here and you've got the spina bifida association, uh, transanal irrigation recommendations in the middle. And you'll notice that that varies a little bit from the manufacturer, um, recommendations for the, uh, transanal irrigation with the balloon catheter. So manufacturer recommends that it, and, and the product, at least our product is indicated for children that, um, are over two years of age. Again, you want to take into consideration all of those factors that I previously discussed, um, but it is indicated for um, kids over two years and up. Um, SBA guidelines say more um, closer to six years old um, to start something like TAI. So I wanted to make sure to mention that. Um, also, again, I'm going <laughs> to say it again. Uh, always keep in mind that constipation and bowel incontinence can lead to those other issues like bladder problems, UTIs, um, skin breakdown, shunt malformation, which nobody wants to happen, um, and that social isolation, which is just really awful. Um, that Those are all things that we want to prevent. And really with all of the age-related guidelines in the... Um, that the great resource that SBA has, has put forth in, in these guidelines, um, they all really have, um, through, the, through the lifespan, there's overarching similarities with the diet and fluid intake, um, the, the possible need for oral or rectal medications or, or those other rectal um, interventions like the cone enema or TAI. 
Um, so with that being said, I want to ask if there are questions specifically to any of the age related um, issues or anything that I've covered to this point. And if nobody, I'll, I'll actually just, I'm going to throw one out because we have um, some common questions that are asked um, by our users of transanal irrigation. So I will go ahead and, and tell you guys one of those is what happens if my child has an accident between the transanal irrigation um, or maybe they don't feel like their bowels are being emptied out, you know, what to do. So I think that um, you want to consider anything that really could be contributing to that, especially if it's a new occurrence. So this is not, they're not having consistent bowel accidents. Um, the first thing to keep in mind is you still want to do their bowel care program as, as it's um, been put forth to you from the healthcare provider. So if they're telling you to do it every day, you still do it. Even if they've had an accident that day, you still want to do the bowel program that night if you're supposed to be doing it every day. That's one thing that I really want to um, make sure that that's clear. Um, it could be change in diet. It could be change in their hydration status. They might have a stomach bug. Let's, let's be real, you know, kids are kind of petri dishes, especially when they're, you know, they're in school and they're in daycare and they're around, you know, a lot of germs. Um, so it could just be that they have a stomach bug and that's not really unordinary for any kid. And just because they have spina bifida doesn't, you know, make them immune to everything else that, that they could be um, catching <laughs> from the other kids. So keep those things in mind. Like I said, con continue to perform the bowel regimen. That's really super important. And if the issue persists, uh, that's when you would want to have a conversation with your healthcare provider uh, to get, you know, further instruction and maybe make adjustments to uh, the amounts of water that are, you know, that's being instilled, for instance. Uh, or maybe if they're on medications, they might want to try to look at, at some of those, those things. So that's a common question that, that we get. Linda, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A. Did you have any other common ones you wanted to share? Or yeah, so, yeah, so there's another one that's more like medication related, especially for those that are using TAI. So, um, you know, should you start or stop any laxative or bulking agent uh, type medication when you're using TAI? Um, this is kind of common practice that you really don't want to change too many things at once. So um, if you're taking those types of medications before you start TAI, you would want to continue on those medications um, until, you know, you give it some time. So, I mean, sometimes it takes up to 12 weeks before people can notice a difference with um, transanal irrigation. So um, you just don't want to change up a bunch of things because then you have no idea what's working and what's not working. Um, and then if you are on a good routine with the TAI and you still are having, you know, issues with maybe your stool is too soft or too hard or whatnot, uh, that's where you would want to talk to the healthcare provider to maybe make some adjustments in those uh, medications or even the amount of water that's being instilled with the, with the system. Melinda, I have a question. It's Judy. How sure. how young do you see people with spina bifida becoming independent with TAI? Uh, I mean, I know like from experience through coloplast, I should say, with TAI, um, we have assisted in training, you know, kids that are 
four and five years old. Um, some younger, but that's definitely more um, help from the caregiver or parent. Um, five, six years old. Okay. Well, they're able to really, you know, as far as, like I said, they might need reminders here and there or something like that. But as far as like getting the, the gist of how to use the system, um, they're, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. I've, I've been, I've sat in on sessions where, where kiddos are being trained and I can think of plenty of, you know, five-year-olds, for instance, five and six-year-olds that are very competent in being able to work the system. Thank you. Is it a resource that tells, you know, we know, we know some states don't cover TAI if you have Medicaid. Yeah. Is yeah. there a resource that can describe that for this country or is it county by county, state by state? So it is, if it's Medicaid, it is state by state. And we do have some resources um, within Coloplast that we share with healthcare providers um, as far as um, insurance coverage for, you know, and it is state specific. Um, there are states that have really, really good coverage and there are states that have very poor coverage. But we do have an overall kind of, um resource again it is state by state um, and it changes all the time <laughs> as far as as that goes so if there's any question um we do have our uh, coloplast care um program in place for um our our product our transanal irrigation product that uh, can help answer those types of questions um for people but we really are trying to educate. We're trying to do our due diligence in educating the healthcare providers so that they're aware right. of, right. you know, the availability. And um, we're we're really uh, feet on the streets trying to get out there and and definitely educate those states that are are more heavily covered with the insurance plans. So if SBA wanted to access Coloplast Care, we could contact you and you could help us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah for sure. Thank you. Absolutely. And I could probably even get you those um, state by state. It's literally every state has their own <laughs> sheet. Um, but we could get you that um, information. But again, really? like I said, really? it is ever changing. So you kind of have to. Right. Well, we have to acknowledge it might be different tomorrow, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, We're constantly, I, like, I would love, I would love to have that if it's possible. Okay. Yeah. yeah we're, I, I can tell you like, we're, we're on the Hill lobbying all the time. Yeah, so <laughs> are we. You know, so are we. Yes. We're right there with you. <laughs> oh, we might, we might have some questions. Wait a second. We do have one question. Okay. You got um, it. That came in. Yes. I'm happy to read it. Um, this is from a parent and she says, or he says, I have an eight-year-old with spina bifida who is on cone enema since he is three and a half years old. He is hesitant to start cleaning his bottom and even calfing himself because of a sensory problem from mm. mild autism. And the question is, do you have any tips or tricks in how to introduce him to start to be a little bit more independent? I would definitely say to have him start um, playing with the equipment <laughs> so at least like let him um start touching and feeling the the catheters the um if he's using a comb you know whatever you're doing for the bowel care you know let him you don't want it to be I don't, i'm not trying to say like you want it to be playtime, but kind of you know you want them to be able to feel especially with the autism component you know, with the sensory issues, just let them play with it. Uh, carve out extra time um, before the bowel program, for instance, or before the catheterization and let them just play with the products and get, you know, used to that. You might be able to even use um, a, a dummy or a doll or something like that to let them practice on that first. Uh, before he would do it, you know, on his own. 
uh, maybe just do one step at a time, you know, like this is how you open the package or this is, you know, this is how you fill the bag. So just kind of take, take it slow, I would say, and just step by step, maybe even write down the steps uh, so that he can uh, see it that way. Cause we all have different styles of learning, right? Those are, those are some things that came to top of mind. <laughs> those are great suggestions. Um, and we did have another question come through and that is some kids are reluctant to take over care tasks that they have grown comfortable with parents doing for them. Are there any options for occupational therapy to work on this as a goal? I think that occupational therapy is an amazing resource. <laughs> so if you have access to that, um, I would highly recommend um, occupational therapy or, or physical therapy, you know, which whichever one is going to be most appropriate. But therapy is awesome. So definitely, I encourage that. I see also um, that, oh yeah, so the visual social story that um, they can look and read through. So the occupational therapist can provide those sorts of things. So yes, yes to OT. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> and especially this is coming from a rehab nurse. So I'm a, I'm a big uh, supporter of of the therapist, they, they're great. I am not seeing any more questions. Are you, Judy, am I missing anything? Or? Nope, I think we've, uh, you've covered the topic well, Belinda, thank you. Oh, good, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to do it. I'm a big, uh, I'm a big supporter of SBA. Like I told you ladies earlier, I was, very, I've been very involved with the Spina Bifida Association of Kentucky here where I live and I think it's, you guys are doing great things. So thanks for what you do as well. Well, yes, thanks Belinda. And thank you to our friends at Coloplast for sponsoring today's session. And thank you for everyone who's attended and um, we will see you all next time. So have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.